Welcome to lecture number five. Today I am going to talk about another application of lasers and that is optical tweezers. So as you know optical tweezers are uh, so tweezer one uses to basically hold very small objects and optical tweezers as the name implies uses optical fields to hold extremely small objects. Now uh, usually this um, such an application is uh, realized using a microscope. So what you have is a tightly focused beam that generates uh, a force which can pull the particles into the focus. So this was originally demonstrated by uh, Arthur Ashkin uh, as early as in so Arthur Ashkin as early as in 1970s. Uh, this was of course the Stephen Chu was another uh, collaborator uh, and it was uh, this was original ideas in 1986 the first demos of this uh, of this effect were done uh, and of course Arthur Ashkin got a Nobel Prize for 20 in 2018 uh, for precisely this. All right, so um, so let's see what we are exactly uh, doing here. We are uh, it's you, you will see that sub there is a lot of similarity between this and the laser cooling idea, where one is applying a force using light on uh, uh, on atoms. Here, what you are talking about is uh, finite size particles or even small particles, uh, which are smaller than the wavelength. All right, so uh, a quick recall, remember that photon uh, carries uh, energy, right, which is simply h times nu, and it also carries a, a momentum p, which is given by h by lambda, this will be h cross k, right, so this is the momentum carried by a photon. So you see, when I take an optical beam, right and focus it tightly uh, into a small spot so imagine i am looking at a um, you know a 10 milliwatt laser light and this light is focused right uh, in basically uh, one micrometer square area right it's focused tightly within the square area. Then one is asking, what is the typical intensity of light, right? So one can calculate the intensity. And you shouldn't be surprised that the intensities are pretty high. So we are talking about 10 times 10 to the power of milliwatt, 10 to the power minus 3 watts, focused on to micrometer square. So that is 10 to the power minus 6 whole square. So that you see is 10 to the power of 10, if you like. Uh, that is watts per meter square, but I can write it down in terms of watts per centimeter square, and then I divide by 10 to the power of 4. So it's basically about a 10 to the power of 6 watts per centimeter square, right? It's basically 1 megawatt per centimeter square. So even a even a normal laser, okay, with a reasonable power level, is able to generate this very large intensities at the focus, right? So you can see that now you know, once you have such large intensities, you need to be careful with them. That is, if particle absorbs significantly this particular radiation, right? So it is the amount of energy that it will it will keep with itself is going to be extremely large. And because the volume is small, it will also absorb this energy quite, quite quickly. And uh, you can have extreme heating of the particle, which is which probably is not what you intend to do here. So what you look for is basically you choose particles which have low absorption 
almost negligible absorption. Required, the second aspect you require is it should have large thermal conductance, right? So that you can basically conduct the heat out to your surrounding medium with ease. Uh, so the uh, so you see uh, if I am looking at particles like this, uh, a particle of choice is basically the silica spheres. So these uh, silica spheres, these are nice transparent, so very low absorption, and they also have significant conductance. And you see these silica spheres can now be moved around if I focus a beam. So there are basically two forces that we have to worry about. I hopefully we understand at least qualitatively what these two forces are. So one is the gradient force, right? And the other one is a scattering force. So these are the two forces that the uh, light, the, the particle would see because of the light. Right, so the gradient force is such that what you are looking now here, as the name suggests, you are looking at the variation of the intensity. And you see, uh, for example, if I come in with uh, the refractive index of the particle is larger than the refractive index of the medium surrounding it, correct? In that situation, you see that uh, what you will get is a, is a force that is, uh, that is such that the particle is attracted towards regions of higher intensity. So, so this is essentially depends, so gradient force, it, it basically depends on the gradient of the intensity. So that is the kind of, you know, dependence that you have. Now let's look at this scattering force. So scattering force is simply the force along the direction of the uh, photon flux. Right, so uh, now uh, I was a small comment. Uh, you see that this gradient force can also be repulsive. So that will happen if I choose my, uh, if I choose the other way around, that is if I choose my NP, is smaller than n medium is repulsed from the higher intensity regions right so this aspect actually comes in with the gradient force all right so these are basically the two forces that we have to worry about and uh, you see that it is this it is this business of sharply focusing it so when you focus a beam you basically create these regions you provide a significant amount of intensity a variation and hence the large gradient and hence the gradient force so one important aspect which i want to state here is that that the force that you generate the forces that you generate are order of 10 to the power of minus 12 of a Newton. Okay, so these are extremely small forces, but then remember that we are looking at extremely small particles as well. So we are looking at micron or some micron sized particles, and then you have got basically this is uh, to remember this is basically pico Newtons, pico Newton kind of forces. All right, so. Essentially, we are going to have two kinds of problems. So one is particle size. So I'm looking at the diameter of the particle, let's call it D. So whether the D is smaller than lambda, this is the limit where we can write down a few analytical expressions, which we'll derive at the end of this uh, lecture. But you can also have the limit when D is much larger than lambda. So uh, in this limit, you see the ray diagram works very well and in this limit we can we can write down as a we can basically write down something for a point dipole and the the intermediate limit when d is of the order of lambda now that is a tough limit and uh, this is usually needs to be solved exactly using numerics so this is the kind of three different regimes that we will uh, focus on
So let's look at this first regime. This we are looking at now large particle size. So large by large, you can clearly see I am comparing the particle size with that of the wavelength. Right. So for the large particle size, we are going to use ray optics. So let me uh, do the following. Right. So I am going to draw out basically uh, uh, the light in red. Right. So let's say that my this is my Gaussian beam. You recall Gaussian beam and this is the focus. So this is the region of the so called the beam base. And, uh, so, and then if you look at the distribution of the intensity in such a Gaussian beam, you will see that so intensity is largely Gaussian where you have essentially uh, the largest intensity at the center of the beam and the intensity falls off on the edges of the beam. So when I'm drawing this line, these two lines, these are basically uh, lines indicating the locus of equal level of intensity, right? So you see that intensity, so the, the beam is getting, beam is getting focused at this region z equal to zero, light is propagating in that direction. And that's the kind of distribution that you have. All right, so this is my, roughly the center of the beam, the light is propagating to the right. And what I have is the maxima, which is sitting at the center and light is falling off on both sides. So that's the kind of profile of the, uh, the Gaussian beam. So you have large intensity at the center, the beam is propagating to the right, the z equal to zero is the location of the, uh, of the focus, right? And let's say I've got a particle now, which is, uh, which is located, let's say in this region, right? So that's my spherical particle. All right. So now let's, let's look at uh, the, the photon pathway through this. So you can clearly see that, let's say this is my center. All right. So this is my particle. And now I'm looking at how the light beam gets scattered from this. So let's look at some ray diagram. So what I have is, this is my, let's say input photon. Obviously the photon bends towards the normal, right? And as it exits out, it is going to be bent away from the normal, right? So that's your path. So this is my photon in and this is my photon out. So let's do some parallel transport here. This is my photon in. This on the other hand is my photon out. That tells me that this would be the direction of my change delta P for the photon. By Newton's second law, if the light has experienced a change in the momentum in that direction, the, the particle itself is going to get a momentum kick in the opposite direction. You can clearly see that the, the scattering events that are going to happen above, that is for the regions of the particle which are closer to the, the beam, uh, the center of the beam, there are going to be many more photons going that way in comparison to uh, or the photons which are going to access the lower part of the particle. Total of all such scattering events, you'll see that the largely the change in the momentum experienced by the majority of the photons is going to be given by this delta P, which is going this way. And hence that the, the force on the particle is going to be in the opposite direction. So you see that the particle itself, so let me draw that, the force of the particle is towards the, towards the regions of large intensity. Orthogonal direction is x. So if I plot my f of x versus x, right? So I'll clearly see that my there will be a large force in that direction and there will be a force. So basically the force is such that it is attractive. It is basically 
pushing the particles back into this this region of largest intensity which is the x equal to 0 the x equal to 0 is this central line about which one is talking about so i'm plotting here the uh, force x component of the force along x absolutely similarly plot the force similarly in the in the y coordinate and so you say there you see that this is going to be a symmetric because it's a cylindrically symmetric beam you are going to have a similar response along the y coordinate so this is one this is what i mean by something called the gradient force which largely is a competition between the number of photons which are going to experience this uh, this variation so this is called the 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 gradient force now let's look at uh, uh, now let's look at the other aspect for example something called the scattering force which is along the direction of a propagation so let's look at the following right so again let me uh, show that my beam is in the same direction you have the z equal to zero plane which is my focusing plane and then what i do is i put it so i come in with a particle right and this particle has so I, so this is my then what happens is my light bends towards the normal and then here it's going to be bent away so i'm looking at a symmetrically placed situation then in that case i'm going to again be going like this and this is going to be my scattered photon right so if, if i'm symmetrically placed you see that uh, now i can write down the the change in the momenta so let's look at photon number one right follow that through so that's a way to do it so you'll have photon number one this is the in photon and you see that the out photon is in that direction i'm doing parallel transport again such a way that my variation is that way so you get a f which is that way f1 would be the force experienced due to number photon number one so if i do this analysis carefully which you can do you will see that f1 is in that direction f2 due to the photon number two which is uh, this photon that is going to create a force f2 that direction such a way that you get an overall force f which is a vector sum of f1 and f2 so you generate basically these two forces from these two photons uh, and you see that the overall force is a vector sum of these two forces giving rise to a force f which is along the direction of the propagation of the optical field this particular force is called the scattering force right so these are the two forces so let me quickly get back one of them has got to do with the particle being pulled towards the center right where is the where the beam intensity is largest and the second force is along the direction of propagation so you see that particle particle basically tends to go towards this central region right which is the region of high intensity right so it is it is it it is it gets uh, it gets localized within this high intensity region that's the region in which the particles would largely lie so one what one has done is basically trap the particle in this high intensity region by the way so there is uh, there are very very interesting issues that one needs to worry about uh, so there are uh, there are uh, this is an area that involves optics uh, mechanics clearly as you have seen we are used as newton's third law to get the forces right and not just that we are now looking at statistical mechanics because you see that when i am putting a particle let's say this is particle is placed in a fluid we are going to have viscous damping forces and then one can i mean there is a very nice 
uh, set of discussion which I'll not get into, which has got to do with the fluctuation dissipation theorem and things of that kind. And uh, essentially, you know, uh, this trapping force, uh, basically the particle is bombarded randomly by uh, molecules of the of the liquid within which it is uh, immersed and then you can you will basically see brownian motion of such a particle if it's a cylindrically symmetric beam then i have the uh, x component of the force which has got its own uh, let me uh, which has got its own spring constant and similarly i have the y component of the force which has got its own spring constant and typically for a cylindrical beam kx will be equal to ky so the force along the z component is usually weaker it is not as tightly bound to the uh, to the spring which is getting it to z equal to 0 so you see that uh, so the 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 final equilibrium position arises from scattering force gradient force let's say you have uh, gravity so then there is going to be gravity imagine these beams are going up or down you are going to have and then if this particle is immersed in a fluid then you are also going to have buoyancy so that is the kind of you know uh, the equilibrium position comes or arising out of all these forces uh, playing together to this to finally reach in position of uh, equilibrium so what is the take home message for large particles, one can use the ray diagram to figure out what is the force experienced by the particle. And you see that the force is attractive if the refractive index uh, is uh, of the particle is larger than the medium within which it is moving around. If one draws the ray diagram correctly, one can easily figure out what is the uh, force which is experienced by the particle by using the Newton's third law. I think I did not write that anywhere. So we have used the Newton's third law to basically get to uh, the forces. And uh, the, the localization is in all the three dimensions along x, along y, as well as along z. Now it's a question of coming out with smart particles and smart particles and uh, smart beams, uh, which can confine the particles. So you see that a lot of development has taken place in this area. Typically, uh, studying biological uh, media, wherein these particles are biological uh, particles, uh, and not just that. What one does is basically choose a smart wavelength, and typically. 975 nanometers is a popular wavelength meters is a popular wavelength which is used because it has negligible absorption uh, by the biological sample as well as negligible absorption in water so this is being used to basically manipulate you know biological particles biological samples and apply forces uh, this is an ex extremely fascinating area of research wherein People have applied these forces within cells to basically manipulate uh, molecular motors that that take you know uh, either proteins or some other baggage from one point to another, wherein these uh, these uh, so these uh, molecular motors are attached to these spherical silica particles, and the silica particles are now uh, modulated using a laser beam. So one can actually tug at it and figure out, for example, the the, the amount of uh, forces required, basically go along the tracks along which the protein is being transported and so on and so forth. It's a fantastically rich area of research and a really, really powerful tool to uh, study small systems in extremely large details. People have now actually used uh, these tweezers to, for example, hold a uh, the twisted in a strand and untwist it by applying these forces and so on so it's it is just an amazing uh, tool uh, which has been used very very effectively by uh, biologists